Hi, everyone, and welcome to our event tonight. I'm Michael Goldsmith from Penguin Random House. Uh, I have just a few housekeeping items to touch on before I turn things over to tonight's fantastic speakers. Uh, if you would like to submit questions for our panelists, you can do so by utilizing the Q&A module, which should be available at the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote questions submitted by others, uh, and you can also activate the Zoom chat, which should also be at the bottom of your screen and comment along with the conversation. We would suggest scrolling, uh, rather, we would suggest toggling your chat from all panelists, which is the default to all panelists and, att and attendees. Uh, this will make your comments available to the whole group and perhaps spark some friendly discussion. Uh, with that said, I'm now going to ask our speakers uh, to start their microphones and cameras uh, to come onto the digital stage. And uh, while our speakers are getting settled, uh, I will introduce them. Uh, Jeffrey Tubin is the best-selling author of books including The Oath, The Nine, Too Close to Call, A Vast Conspiracy, and The Run of His Life, which was made into the critically acclaimed FX series, American Crime Story, People vs. O.J. Simpson. He's a staff writer at The New Yorker, the senior legal analyst at CNN, and author most recently of True Crimes and Misdemeanors, the investigation of Donald Trump, which we are all gathered here tonight to discuss. And then leading tonight's discussion is Wolf Blitzer, who is CNN's lead political anchor and the anchor of The Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer, which airs weekdays at 5 p.m. Eastern, providing viewers with in-depth reports about the political, international, and breaking news stories of the day. Uh, with that said, I'll welcome everyone and hand the microphone off to uh, Wolf and to Jeff. Michael, thank you very much. Uh, one minor correction, maybe not such a minor correction, but a correction uh, that uh, Jeffrey is our chief legal analyst, not our senior. Is that right, Jeffrey? Am I, am I, can, am can, I correct? can I say, you bet your ass that's yeah. right. Yes. <laughs> you are, because we have a lot of, we have I, I, plenty well, of legal analysts, we have plenty of senior legal analysts, but you are our chief legal analyst. Right. I just want but, to make sure but that, that is precise. I'm, I'm tough but fair with the other legal analysts. We like them all, but you're the chief, uh, and we have to show you the respect, respect for that. Uh, right. I've got a bunch of serious, tough questions, but a couple uh, easy ones first, just to get going. Uh, first of all, tell us why you wrote this book. Okay, but first of all, uh, even before that, in the best political tradition, I'm not going to answer that question. I am going to answer the question of why am I wearing a tie? Because, um, I, you know, I, th this is a gesture of respect for the great wolf. Um, but the, he used to have an executive producer. I don't even know if, if you knew this. Jay Shaler was the executive producer. I know you knew he was the executive producer. Of course. But he had a rule for all of us who were guests. Not only did you have to wear a tie if you were a man, but you were not allowed to wear blue jeans ever on the set. And, you know, some of us would say, well, you, you, can't, like, you can't see your pants. What difference does it make? Jay didn't care. Jay made sure you didn't wear blue jeans. So I'm neither wearing blue jeans and I am wearing a tie in honor of you, Wolf. And, um, you know, did you know that that was a note? I knew exactly jeans? that because I heard from many of your colleagues why can't I wear jeans <laughs> if nobody's going to see? Well, you know, he was very precise in he, that he, matter. He was a good and, man. And, and you are now not, uh, I just want to point out, Jeff, you're not in the situation room. You're in the situation Zoom right oh. now. I just want to point that out. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, I and just want to make, I, make I it clear. Now you can go ahead and I answer the question. Tell us why you wrote this book. Well, you know, um, I like to tell a story. And, you know, one of the things that I, I, I learned from one of my great editors um, at Doubleday, um, Phyllis Graham, you know, F Phyllis, um, she, she edited uh, the, the, the Nine and the Oath and contributed to uh, many, you know, several of the other books I'd written. And one of the things she always said was, you know, as important as any story is, you have to tell a story, you have to have a narrative, you have to care about the people, and you have to have a narrative arc. You have to sort of begin with one idea and one group of people with one goal and see how it works out. And in May of 2017, I worked out with Bill Thomas, my editor at Doubleday. I said, let's do, an, let's do a book about the Mueller investigation. At that point, you know, I, I had no access to Mueller. I was just following it 
like every other journalist from the outside, but I knew it would be a story that ended in success, in failure, in Trump's vindication, in Trump's conviction. But I wanted to follow that story. And it was, you know, this is my eighth book. This was definitely the hardest book I've written because first of all, there, I had no access to Mueller while the investigation was going. Fortunately, I got access to the office when they closed up shop, but I also didn't know where it was going. And, and of course, the great surprise, although it was, I think, fortunate for me as, as a journalist and as a writer, was that the story em evolved into the Ukraine congressional investigation and impeachment. So there was this narrative, but that's really why I wanted to do the book not because I had some burning desire to convict Donald Trump or acquit Donald Trump. I wanted to tell a story of, of what it was like um, to investigate a president, and, and that's what I tried to do. In and, and, and you tell it beautifully. It's an amazing story with a lot of new information, and I, I highly recommend it. Uh, the book, I'm looking at the book cover right now, and it says True Crimes and Misdemeanors. That's the name of the book, is that right? That, that is indeed. <laughs> okay, so why is it called True Crimes and misdemeanors, as opposed to high crimes and misdemeanors, which is a, 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 a phrase that we learned about many, many years ago. Correct. And, and you know, the, the, the Constitution uh, passed, you know, rat, written and ratified in the late 18th century um, has many phrases that, that have become familiar to us, but four of the most consequential words and most debated words are high crimes and misdemeanors, which is the standard for impeachment, uh, impeachment of a president. And uh, one of the things that we have, um, th th that, that has been a subject of debate, uh, certainly since 1868 and the impeachment of, of Andrew Johnson, uh, is what do those words mean? And, and uh, because they are not, uh, it is not apparent what, 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 you know, it's not obviously apparent what they mean. And uh, obviously this, uh, my book goes through the impeachment proceeding in the House and the trial in the Senate. But the point I wanted to make with the title was that if you go back to the Mueller investigation, Mueller did prove, I think, that the president committed high crimes. I mean, the true crimes, that he committed actual criminal offenses, specifically obstruction of justice and um, I wanted I wanted to highlight that, but also you know be a little cute and bring it together with um, the, the famous words in the Constitution. And you did that uh, when the president says there was no collusion, no obstruction. You say half. What right. do you say? Half right. Um, you know, I, I think to be fair to the president, which I always try to do, whether I'm on a situation room or in writing a book, um, you know, one of the uh, great mysteries uh, of, the, uh, of, of the Mueller investigation and of the past three years in our, in our lives is, did the president uh, collude or conspire or agree with the Russians during the 2016 campaign. Because one thing that's very clear, and, and you know, Mueller, I don't think gets enough credit for the degree to which he proved this, which is there was an intensive, detailed, um, successful attempt by the Russian government to get Donald Trump elected president. You know, one of, one of Putin's closest friends ran something called the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, where Putin grew up. And they, they engaged in a very systematic effort to use social media, usually mostly Facebook, but also Twitter and Instagram, um, to um, help Trump and hurt Hillary Clinton. But even more significant than that uh, was the hacking effort, which was done directly by the Russian government. There was no corporate cutout there. It was um, the, the Russian, Russian military intelligence you know, engaged, you know, uh, attacked the emails of the Democratic National Committee um, and John Podesta, Clinton's campaign chair, to very devastating effect about the, in the Clinton campaign. And um, the question that hovered over um, Trump's presidency from the beginning 
was what did Trump do in return for that? What, why did Russia help? Was there some sort of agreement between uh, Trump personally and anyone uh, associated with Russia, including, of course, Putin himself? And I think the answer to that is it's not proven, and it never was proven. And uh, I think it's fair to, to say that at least as far as we know, there was no collusion. Now, the irony here is that um, Trump wanted to collude with Russia. Trump wanted to uh, ingratiate himself with Putin, but there never was the meeting of the minds that the criminal law requires. Once we jump ahead to um, Ukraine story, it's a very different matter. But as for obstruction, you bet there was obstruction. There was not just the intent to obstruct justice by the president of the United States, but repeated acts of obstruction of justice. You know, the, the president telling James Comey, the FBI director, to go easy on Michael Flynn, the, 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 na the, the national security advisor, firing Comey when, when Comey wouldn't do that, telling his, his, his White House counsel, Don McGahn, to fire Mueller, and then telling, Comey, uh, telling McGahn to lie uh, about that episode. All of that, I think, was worse than anything Bill Clinton did that got him impeached and anything that Richard Nixon did that got him forced out of office. So as I say, half right, there was no collusion, but there certainly was obstruction. As, and so when you say obstruction, you mean obstruction of justice, which is a crime, right? Exactly. And, that, and that's, you know, just going back to my title, that is, a, 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 you know, a, a garden variety uh, crime that is prosecuted in the federal courts all the time. It, it, you know, and one of the things I think Mueller doesn't get enough credit for is the meticulousness of his examination of that issue of obstruction of justice. And, you know, the, the Mueller report, all 400 plus pages of it, I, I think it's it's one of those books, it's sort of like Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time. It was more purchased than read. And, but, but I read it uh, several times. And Mueller really built a incredibly powerful case against the president for obstruction of justice. As I suspect we'll get to, he didn't reach the appropriate conclusion in the report, but the facts he laid out were incredibly damning, I thought. Why didn't Mueller demand testimony from the President of the United States? There was a written, some written questions, written answers that his lawyers you know, basically wrote up, but there was really no follow-up, no demand that the President sit down and answer questions. Why? You know, you know th this is one of the main themes of my book, and, and I, I, it, it, it goes through many, many months of, of, of negotiations, and, and I am very critical of Mueller for his failure to subpoena and even to attempt to get oral testimony from the president because I thought that was uh, central to, to his mission and um, you know it just an incredibly important part of the evidence if you were going to do a thorough investigation. So your, your question is, well, why didn't he? Why didn't he issue a grand jury subpoena? Well, I think there were several reasons. Part of it was, I think, some clever lawyering on the part of um, Trump's defense team, which went through several iterations. Like any, 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 uh, any kind of Trump staff goes through many iterations because he's always firing people. But uh, originally it was John Dowd and, and Jay Sekulow. Um, Jay Sekulow stayed on, John Dowd was, was eased out, and Rudy Giuliani came in. And one of the things all those lawyers did was they never said no to Mueller outright. They sort of strung him along and they said, oh, well, maybe we'll answer questions about the campaign, but not about the, uh, not about the uh, presidency. Maybe we'll answer written questions. Uh, show me the subjects that you're interested in. And one thing defense attorneys always like is delay, uh, especially in a circumstance like this where Mueller did not want to go on for years the way Ken Starr did, the way Lawrence Walsh did. He wanted to do this quickly. And the defense worked on that, and, and they, 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 they used that for leverage. And, you know, in January of 2018, there was actually a tentative date set for an, for, for an examination of Trump by Mueller's team at, at Camp David. But John Dowd, who was then the lawyer 
pulled the plug and said, I wasn't going to do that. And I think Dowd recognized that Trump is a compulsive liar and, you know, would have lied under oath about this. And he quite appropriately said, I'm not going to allow this. That was the moment that Mueller really should have just dropped a grand jury subpoena because, of course, it would have been challenged in court. But if it was in January of 2018, it could have been wrapped up by the end of the Supreme Court term in 2018. And, and that was, Mueller only would have been in office for a little more than a year at that point. But Mueller agreed to keep negotiating, and he went, it went on and on to the fall. And finally, Mueller, at that point, thought he was running out of time, and he settled for these written questions um, only about the campaign, nothing about the presidency. And as you suggested in, in your question, the answers were largely written by the lawyers, two of the more unsung but very effective lawyers on Trump's behalf, um, Jane and Marty Raskin, two, two criminal defense lawyers from Miami. And they uh, basically drafted very uh, bland answers that were full of I don't recalls, nothing that could get the president into trouble. And Mueller was stuck with that. And at that point, he thought he had run out of time. But I think it was a, a crucial failure on, on Mueller's part not to issue a grand jury subpoena. And you go further in the book uh, and you ask an important question. All right, maybe he, he didn't want to get the, go to get a grand jury subpoena to question the president. Uh, the written questions and answers were basically worthless. Uh, but he didn't even go after the president's tax returns or his dealings with Deutsche Bank and other banks. Why? Well, again, th this, you know, this one, I think Mueller uh, is a little, is on more solid ground here because, you know, what's important to remember about Mueller is that he was a special counsel, uh, which means he was an in employee of the Department of Justice. He was a subordinate of Rod Rosenstein, the Deputy Attorney General. He was not an independent counsel, the way Starr was, the way Lawrence Walsh was. And they had an independent uh, legal power base. They had much more freedom of action. Mueller um, would have had to go to Rosenstein and ask for permission to subpoena uh, the tax returns, to su subpoena the records. And it really was outside his jurisdiction. Now, um, one of the questions that has hovered over the entire Trump presidency has been, what is it about Vladimir Putin and Russia that Trump makes Trump never criticize him? Why does he have enormous deference towards the, pres towards the president of Russia? And it, it is possible that the tax returns or the Deutsche Bank records might have answered that question. You know, was there some sort of financial tie he had to Russia? But he had no specific evidence of that. And, and Mueller thought that um, the, the um, financial story was too far afield from his original jurisdiction so that he didn't even ask uh, Rosenstein for permission to go after it. Other prosecutors might have made another judgment. But uh, I, I, I think this was a tough call, unlike the subpoena, which I think is an easier call. And he decided um, not, not, to, not to pursue that part of the investigation. Do you believe Mueller gave President Trump a free pass? I don't, I, I think that's, that's too harsh. I, I don't think it's a free pass. Um, you know, Mueller, Mueller is, you know, I, I begin the book with this scene of the one and only meeting between Mueller and, uh, and Trump, which was on May 16th, 2017, when uh, Mueller comes in to offer the president advice on who should be the new FBI director after the president has fired James Comey. And, you know, I, I have a tableau of the two men there. And, you know, what's interesting is that they have a lot in common on the surface. You know, they were both born in the, during World War II, Mueller, 1942, um, Trump, 1944, both born in wealth. M Mueller's father was an executive at DuPont. But both went to Ivy League schools, Princeton and Penn. And you know, so, so they come out of, in some respects, the same world. 
but they couldn't be more different as human beings. You know, Trump has never done anything until he became president that wasn't explicitly just for Donald Trump. You know, he, he spent his entire life working for the Trump, Trump organization. Uh, Mueller is an institutionalist. Mueller is someone who has devoted his life to institutions, whether it's the Marine Corps or the FBI or the Justice Department, to institutions bigger than he was. And I, I think he is not someone who was sort of out to get Donald Trump. Uh, you know, that, that's one of the incredibly, uh, you know, the, the, the ironies of this story is that Trump and Giuliani demonized Mueller as, as out to get Mueller. But as I think I tell him the story, there were um, several important areas where he pulled back from pursuing Trump fully. But a free pass is, 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 is too much. I mean, if you read the Mueller report, if you see the evidence that he collected, it's devastating. It's totally devastating. And it took a tremendous amount of initiative and skill and energy to assemble that, that devastating picture uh, of, of Trump. And, and so, you know, just because Trump was not forced out of office, which he never was going to be by the uh, Senate, regardless of what the evidence disclosed. Uh, I think a free pass is, is, is too harsh and unfair a judgment on, on Mueller's work. So let's go through a few specifics because you've got a lot of new information in there. Rudy Giuliani, uh, he was one of the president's personal attorneys in all of this. What grade would you give him in representing and defending the president? Well, you know, that it, 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 it's, you know, one of the things I love about being able to write a book is that you know, you get to look at people in depth, and Giuliani is such a bizarre and interesting character. And, and uh, you know, he and Trump go back to the 80s, and I, I talk about the first time that they met in the 80s. And, and if you look at Giuliani's, you know, aggressive, in-your-face, uh, racially inflammatory term as mayor, he was sort of a prototype for Donald Trump. Um, that That's the 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 style and the politics um, that Giuliani, uh, you know, effectively as mayor, not so effectively as a presidential candidate, uh, brought is something that, uh, Mull that, that, that Trump exploited. In the Russia investigation, I think uh, Giuliani did a very effective job. As I say, he, he, he strung out the subpoena negotiations for a long time. More importantly, he used his bully pulpit in sometimes excessive ways, but he demonized Mueller and he took advantage of our polarized politics to turn Mueller into just another Democrat, even though Mueller himself is a Republican. He turned Mueller into uh, someone that the, the Trump base and the Republican Party could disdain. And that was something that really had an effect on Mueller's leverage in this situation. So I think he gets a high grade. However, this is why the story I think gets so interesting. Giuliani was so full of himself and so full of his success in the Mueller investigation, he starts leading this crazy Ukraine crusade where he recruits these two very marginal figures you know, Lev Parnas and, Igor, and his friend Igor. And they basically start this lunatic Iran, uh, um, Ukraine investigation to try to bring down Joe Biden in his candidacy. And this was outrageously, in addition to being ineffective, it was terrible judgment. I mean, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Rudy Giuliani single-handedly got Donald Trump impeached because of his involvement in Ukraine. And I think that was a catastrophic failure of lawyering. So on the one hand, he did well with Russia. He failed terribly with regard to uh, Ukraine. And share, uh, it's an interesting little nugget you have. Uh, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, during the whole Ukraine impeachment process, he was having some issues, some personal issues, right? Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, when, I, when I heard from Adam Schiff this story, I felt physically painful, uh, in physical pain, because Schiff was having terrible dental problems 
throughout the entire trial in the Senate. And the, his dentist told him that um, if, if I give you a, a root canal, which would solve the problem, you might not be able to speak for a couple of days. And, and obviously, as, as the lead manager, he couldn't do that. So we kept getting these sort of stopgap uh, measures that really didn't cure the pain. And any of us who have had dental problems or root canals know how painful that can be. So the fact that, that uh, Schiff did, I think, quite an admirable job leading the house managers while dealing with dental distress is to me a, kind of, a, a pretty remarkable achievement. A, a human side of the story. Another interesting nugget you, you report on, uh, the government shutdown at the end of 2018 all of a sudden, you have FBI agents, you have others involved in the investigation. They're out of work, right? Well, they, they weren't out of, out of work. They were out of being paid. That's important. And, Payment um, is important. Pay, pay, is, pay is very important. And, you know, for, for, for weird bureaucratic reasons, the lawyers on Mueller's staff were considered essential. So they considered continued to be paid. But the FBI analysts and FBI agents on, on the staff were not considered to be uh, essential. And they frankly weren't even supposed to be working at all, though they did continue to work. But, you know, a lot of these people, I mean, they were all, you know, not highly paid. So several of these FBI employees, while they were doing the Mueller investigation to try to make ends meet during the, uh, during the government shutdown, some worked as dog walkers on weekends, some worked as Uber drivers, and, you know, it, it would have been really interesting to know, you know, as we were driving in, in, an, in, a, in a, you know, being riding around in an Uber, that one of the people actually was involved in one of the most high profile investigations in, in American history. If only to just ask the driver what was going on. And I know you've been giving a lot of thinking to this. Let's say uh, President Trump is reelected on November 3rd. This whole investigation, Russia, Ukraine, impeachment, How's that going to imp impact the second term? Oh, I think I, I think it will have a very Im impact because you know w one of the iron laws of nature is that if bullies succeed, bullies um, feel vindicated and continue to act in, in, in a bullying fashion. And you only need see, you know, the the amazing confluence of events on July twenty fourth and July twenty fifth uh, of two thousand nineteen. You know, July 24th was the day that Robert Mueller testified uh, before the two House, House committees. And I think it is safe to say, and accurate to say, he did a bad job. He was not clear, convincing, uh, emphatic. Uh, he did not uh, do a good job of explaining what he had found or what, what its significance was. And it really was a punctuation mark on the failure of the Mueller investigation. So what does Donald Trump do the following morning? The following morning, July 25th, he, he tweets some happy news about what a bad job Mueller did uh, very early that morning. And then he gets on the phone with President Zelensky, the new president of Ukraine. And he leans on him. He colludes with him. He says, in effect, I, need, I, 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 I want you to do me a favor though. I need you to um, investigate the Bidens, um, Hunter Biden's role, um, and, and in a not very uh, subtle way says, this military aid that you need, uh, you will only get if you do this. It, it, it was uh, really an act, uh, an act of extortion with the government's money. He did that because he was emboldened by Mueller's failure. Imagine after all this time, if, and after all this effort, and, and after my book <laughs> comes out, that the president is reelected. He will take it, and I think correctly, as a vindication of his entire first term. So he will continue doing what he did in Ukraine, which was conduct American foreign policy, not in the national interest, but in his personal interest, perhaps as he considers a second term in his personal financial interest. I mean, it is, um, it is a dead certainty. And, and I think Trump would say this himself, that if he is reelected, 
he will take that as an affirmation that everything he did in the first term was fine and he can do it again. We're getting ready to get some questions from our, our viewers out there. Uh, this is the book, uh, True Crimes and Misdemeanors, The Investigation of Donald Trump. Before we take the first question from a viewer, I, I want to just point out something that's very personal to me, Jeffrey, and very personal to all of our colleagues. The book is dedicated, and I'm quoting now, to my fellow journalists. You dedicate this excellent book to my fellow journalists. Tell us why. You know, can, can I, can I, t I just uh, forgive a, a small tangent here. You know, Wolf, uh, one, one of the things I always notice about you on, on the Situation Room and all your, you know, you, the, the, all the time you're on CNN, you, you are the definition of a down the middle journalist. But one of the, the only times I ever see your ire rise is when there are attacks on the First Amendment and on journalists. That is something that is obviously very important to you. Um, I, I think, um, you know, when, when the president talks about, you know, enemies of the people, that, that is, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think deeply a, a, a offensive to you, as it certainly is to me, given the role journalists have in the United States. And, you know, the, the reason I dedicated um, the book to my fellow journalists is this has been a very rough time for journalists, in, in part because, um, you know, just of the economics of journalism. I mean, the, the internet has turned the business upside down, newspapers in particular, and, and it's just the economics are, are, are really bad for a lot of people who, who try to practice journalism. Fortunately, we at CNN are doing fine. But in addition, you know, the, the, the president and his supporters have thought it um, a, an appropriate and effective strategy to demonize the work that we do with phrases that are very familiar fake news, enemies of the people. And, you know, I feel strongly that that's not the case, that, you know, we are certainly imperfect and we make mistakes, but um, there's a reason why freedom of the press is mentioned in the First Amendment to the Constitution, because it's essential um, to, um, to our democracy. And um, I just wanted to take this sort of high profile opportunity of that dedication to say, I'm proud to be a journalist. I'm proud that the work we at CNN have done the past three years, I think in particular, the Washington Post and the New York Times have done a really admirable job covering the president. And so I'm glad you called attention to that, Wolf, because- Yeah, no, it's, it's really important. I, I'm on, I, I'm involved in an organization, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. I'm on the steering committee, have been for many years. Uh, I don't know how you feel, but I believe in freedom of the press. I think it's important. Maybe there's another side, or something, but but I think freedom of the press is very important. It's not only important, but you know, there's been a lot of personal ugliness in the past Terrible. three years that you know that 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 our colleagues have suffered. Uh, you know, um, one, one of uh, one of the things people don't see on CNN is. Uh, you know, what it's like for our photojournalists to cover uh, Trump rallies and, and the abuse they take. And um, it, it's just, you know, criticism is fine. We're big boys and girls. We can be criticized for, for, our, uh, for, for wor the work that we do, for what we choose to cover or don't cover, mistakes that we may make. But the idea that we are enemies of the people and intentionally broadcast fake news it is offensive to me. It's not true, and uh, I wanted. To, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad you noticed that I called attention to it. Yeah, and I want to thank you for that. That, that that's really important, uh, Michael. I, I, do we have any questions from any of our guests out there? We sure do, Wolf. Um, and thanks so much to you both for the wonderful presentation thus far. I'll just pop in here and give one or two questions to Jeff, and then I'll hand things back off to Wolf while he gathers the remainder. So, Jeff, uh, Alan in the audience asks. Jeffrey, I loved your, uh, your Patricia Hearst book. Uh, with this new book, which I look forward to reading, have you thus far received any feedback from the White House administration yet? Feedback from the, well, you know, it's only, it only came out on Tuesday, and, uh, or I guess it was last Tuesday, so it's, uh, what's today, Tuesday, so it's one week. Uh, I have not, I have not heard, uh, heard back from um, the, the, the people in the White House. Um, I guess, that's just, that's the answer. I have not, I, I mean, I, I was fortunate to be able to interview several of them, uh, but I, I have not heard back yet. Fair enough. Um, Patricia asks, Jeffrey, just got the book and I'm looking forward to reading. 
My question is, if you were Robert Mueller, what would you have done differently? Also, do you anticipate writing another book on the Trump administration? Um, <laughs> uh, well, the, the two things I would have done differently, uh, in, very emphatically, is I would have issued a grand jury subpoena to the president for his testimony, no, as, as Wolf and I discussed. The other thing I, w I would have done is, uh, Wolf and I don't think talked about this, uh, is um, in the final report, I thought Mueller did a brilliant job of laying out the evidence on obstruction of justice, but he had this very convoluted reasoning for why he didn't reach a conclusion about whether the president committed a crime. He said that, you know, because under Department of Justice policy, he couldn't uh, indict the president. You can't indict a sitting president. But, uh, and, and, he, and Mueller reasoned, well, because I can't indict him, the president can't get his day in court to respond. So I'm not going to even say that uh, the president committed a crime because that would be unfair. I thought that was tortured reasoning, and I thought uh, it was rather naive under the circumstances because it allowed uh, William Barr, the attorney general, who turns out to have been an extreme partisan, um, to mislead the public about what Trump actually, con uh, what Mueller concluded. And uh, so I think that that phrasing and that absence of a conclusion was a real uh, mistake uh, on the part of, of Mueller and his staff. Am I going to write another book about the Trump administration? Well, I think that depends uh, principally on when the, when the uh, Trump administration ends. Uh, as you may know, there's an election coming up. And, uh, and the, the administration may be over in January. If that's the case, uh, I can be certain that I will not be writing another book about the Trump administration. But if there are four more years, uh, given, at the pace we've been going, there are a lot of legal issues that always arise in the, in the, uh, in, uh, when Donald Trump is involved. So uh, I, I may, but uh, I, uh, no commitments one way or the other. Time will tell. Uh, Wolf, uh, have you received the uh, follow-up on yes, questions? Yes, I have. I have some excellent questions from, uh, from our viewers out there. We have a question from Doug Stewart. Uh, hi, Jeffrey. Congrats on the book release. In your opinion, is the story of the Mueller investigation and Trump impeachment one of the impeachment process working as intended or of a system broken by the president? Wow, that's a great question. Um, hmm. You know, I think actually the the system the structure set up by the uh the framers is a good one uh you know it should not be easy uh to impeach a president of the united states you know we don't have a parliamentary system you know in in a parliamentary system if there is a loss of confidence in the legislature the 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 prime minister is out and that's um that's how the system is designed and that's a perfectly legitimate system. That's not our system. We have a system where a president is, a, is, is elected for a four-year term. And he's both the head of government and the head of state. And we don't remove a president lightly. So I think the structure of a majority vote in the House of Representatives and a two-thirds requirement for uh, the Senate uh, is a good one. Uh, my problem is not with the structure and not with the, you know, my problem is with the Republican Party, which reflects more, a, which looks to me more like a Trump cult at this point than a, um, you know, a, 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 any sort of uh, independent thinking political party. You know, I, I thought back often to uh, the Nixon impeachment, where what really sealed Nixon's fate was the seven Republicans on the House uh, Judiciary Committee who voted to impeach the, the, the president. I mean, it was a bipartisan condemnation. And then once uh, impeachment uh, w was, was a foregone conclusion, it was uh, three distinguished Republicans, Barry Goldwater, Hugh Scott, and John Rhodes, who went to the president, Nixon, and said, you know, you're going to lose in the Senate. We don't support you anymore and thus Nixon resigned. That sort of integrity, 
with the single exception uh, of Mitt Romney, uh, was really absent in in this um, in this in this scandal, and, and I think that's um, that's the grievance I have, not with the structure uh, that the framers set up. We have another question from Claire Farley. I'll read it to you. Uh, this is uh, the question. Mr. Blitzer touches on a great line of questioning. Mr. Tubin, why was Mr. Mueller so reluctant to draw a conclusion that the president committed obstruction during Mr. Mueller's impeachment testimony or in prosecutorial terms? Why was he reluctant to draw a conclusion on the ultimate issue? Well, what he said was in his report was that um, under Department of Justice policy, uh, which as a special counsel he was obliged to follow. He couldn't indict the president, that, 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 that they, there is a policy, and I happen to think it's a good policy, it's an appropriate policy, that uh, you, the, the, the federal government cannot indict a sitting president. Uh, you know, given our, our constitutional structure, uh, the president is the single irreplaceable person. You can't, uh, you know, you, you, you can sit with the Supreme Court with only eight justices. You know, you, you, the members of the legislature can come and go because there are lots of others uh, who will still be there. But um, we can't have a system where uh, the president of the United States is both intellectually and emotionally preoccupied with a trial or sitting in court all day. Um, I mean, it, it, just, it just would not work. So we have this provision called impeachment um, so that you can get rid of them. So the, the, the J Department of Justice has this policy that says, you have to wait till a president has left office to, to um, indict him if you want to do that. Um, Mueller said, well, in light of this policy, where I will not indict him, uh, it, it, that means the president would not have his day in court to defend himself over any charges I might make. In light of that, I will not say, I will not conclude whether he committed a crime because he couldn't, he, the, the, he had no way to respond to that. I think that was really crazy reasoning, to be honest. I think um, the president, of course, had an opportunity to respond. And all it did was pull the most important punch that, that Mueller had and the, and the most serious finding that he had. And again, as I said, opened up the door for his findings to be uh, misinterpreted by uh, by, by William Barr. So um, that, that, that's, that's, the, that's the reasoning that, um, that Mueller and his team um, expressed, but I just don't buy it. Oh, uh, there's a question from Anonymous. Were you able to interview Mueller in your research for the project? Uh, I was not. Uh, Mueller chose not to speak to me, but I was fortunate to speak to quite a few members of his staff. And uh, I feel confident that that they they the, they their participation in the book was was authorized by Mueller, and uh, they faithfully, uh, I think, uh, reflected his views. Of course, I would have very much liked to interview Mueller. I tried very hard to to get him to talk to me, but but you know he he comes from a an, a very old school tradition of you know prosecutors speak in the courtroom or in legal papers or not at all. And um, that's why he was so, or that's one reason he was so reluctant uh, to give congressional testimony because he thought, you know, my report is what I have to say. I don't want to elaborate on it. And um, I, I thought that was an, an excessively uh, closed way of, of, of conducting himself. And frankly, poignantly, I also think you know, Robert Mueller is a diminished person from what he was, even uh, when he was appointed in 2017. You know, he was 72 when he was appointed. He was 74 uh, when he finished. It was an incredibly grueling, demanding job. Uh, and it took a toll on him. And, and I think uh, he does not want to engage um, with journalists. He does not want to engage with the public. He has not done anything. Um, public uh, since then. One of the things I learned about, um, which I thought was interesting and poignant, is that he may, uh, Mueller made an unscheduled appearance at uh, a just an ordinary class at Harvard Law School um, dur during, during the fall. And uh, he talked a little bit about the investigation, but he talked about his life. And he said, 
you know, his life was really defined uh, by the Marine Corps mission of honor and integrity. And that, uh, and that, and and that's how the way he's tried to live his life. And I think, by and large, he has uh, lived his life that way. But um, I, I, I don't know um, that you know he he was quite up to the moment uh, that was demanded of him in this investigation. Yeah, this is a question from Wolf Blitzer. Uh, he's a big fan. Uh, <laughs> what about the? Let's say that there's uh, it's a one-term Trump presidency between now January twentieth of next year, Bill Barr, the Attorney General of the United States, we're all waiting for this investigation, this report from uh, an Attorney General, uh, a, a U.S. Attorney who ha who's been conducting a review of everything that has happened, and we anticipate it could, it could be released in the next few weeks or maybe the next month or two that could have an impact, right? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, when, when Barr testified recently before Congress, uh, he, he all but said it will come out before, uh, b before the election. John Durham, the U.S. attorney in Connecticut, is conducting it. You know, um, And John Durham is a respected U.S. attorney. He, he is a respected U.S. attorney. The, the jurisdiction of, the, of, of this particular investigation is, as I understand it, I mean, we'll, we'll know more when the report comes out, is sort of the origin of the Russia investigation, even before Mueller. You know, the, the period... Um, of, you know, during 2016, when the FBI, you know, got, war you know, when, when they started hearing that um, the, uh, uh, th that, that the Russians were, were in, in uh, trying to reach out to members of the, of the uh, Trump campaign staff, George Papadopoulos and others, and they started this investigation. Um, I, I, my understanding is the report do, will not deal particularly with Mueller himself. It's sort of pre-Mueller. But, you know, at this point, um, I don't imagine there are a lot of voters out there who are going to change their vote based on the, or, you know, what John Durham says about the origins of the Russia investigation. You know, one, one of the things we've all noted, Wolf, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the Trump presidency is that the news happens very fast. You know, Donald Trump was acquitted in the Senate in February. It's August now. It's not like ancient history, but it does feel like ancient history. Yeah. So, so the idea that, you know, the, the, somehow a report about the origin of the Russian investigation will, will, will change the outcome of the election seems, seems rather far-fetched to me. Uh, but but it could be a significant report. Uh, the president of the United States keeps saying he's anticipating this report will prove what he repeatedly says, including in recent days. Not only was this a witch hunt, it was treason what the Democrats did, what President Obama did, Vice President Biden did, spying on his campaign. He says that's never happened before. Well, I mean, you know, it, it, the, the, pre the president says a lot of things. And, and, and the idea that anything here was treason. I mean, treason has a specific meaning. Treason, treason is not just something Donald Trump doesn't like. Treason is a specific crime. It's actually one of the few crimes actually mentioned in the Constitution, which is helping an enemy in a time of war. Which carries the death penalty. Too. Which, which carries the death penalty. I mean, only Donald Trump could see this as any, any sort of, of, of treason, but you know, we'll see. I mean, William Barr has proved to, to be a relentless partisan on Trump's behalf. Uh, as you point out, John Durham has a, uh, a respected reputation, but um, I, I, I find it very hard to believe uh, that this report, regardless of what it says, in, in, in a world in which the country is struggling with a pandemic and a recession, people are going to say, oh, you know, the origin of the Russia investigation, that's going to be my voting issue. But, you know, after 2016, I'm, I am out of the prediction business about elections. So I don't know what's going to happen. A, a, a curious question I have, and I've asked this question to a lot of journalists, investigative journalists like you, and you're one of the best journalists. Uh, did I mention you're our chief legal analyst <laughs> at, at CNN? Thank uh, you. But it, it's, a, it's a question that often, you know, I wonder about. Uh, you, you came across a lot of new information in writing this excellent new book. And we, I learned a lot, and I thought I knew a lot about it. I covered it on a daily basis, but I learned a lot uh, reading the book. You had new information. You, you work for CNN. You write for The New Yorker. Uh, 
how do you know when you're going to keep new information for the book as opposed to releasing that information that week or that day? It's, it's a dilemma that a lot of journalists, excellent journalists, respected journalists, investigative journalists have to face in writing a book. Well, um, I mean, that, that, you're, you're right. It, it, it is a dilemma. Um, w when I'm working on a book, uh, like, uh, as I was, you know, for, for a couple of years, uh, or I guess I, 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 was on, I was on leave from New Yorker for about a year. So I was not really writing for the New Yorker. So that was not an issue. Um, the, um, as for CNN, you know, most of the time when I'm with, on with you or with Anderson, you know, I, we are reacting to the news of the day rather than, you know, going back, which is what I'm, what I'm doing in, in, in book research. The other thing was, I mean, a, a, as I mentioned, you know, and this was extremely unnerving for me as a journalist, most of what I learned about the Mueller office, I learned after Mueller had closed up shop. So I didn't, I, I, it, there, there really was no exact context to put it out on, on CNN or even in the New Yorker until I, I, I held it all together. But uh, it is a balance and uh, of, of, you know, keeping keeping my various masters happy but uh it, it, it it's th that's that's how i think about it well the reviews have been excellent uh, the book is excellent uh, you deserve a lot of credit for working i don't know where you get the time to do all that research that reporting checking uh but uh, you, you really have done an amazing job well, not just this but you and i go way back uh, to an <laughs> earlier era i don't know if you remember the oj simpson trial. I, I think you were involved in reporting on that too, right? I think I, I covered it for my high school paper. That's how old I was. Yeah. No, I, I, <laughs> no, I'm afraid I, uh, uh, we, we, we lived through that. We lived through that one too. Yeah. Yeah. Some uh, big stories. Uh, all right. So is there any final thought you'd like to leave? Uh, well, yeah, we're, the, the, we're getting told that we have the to most important this. thought is, I, you know, nobody works a longer a day than Wolf Blitzer. So I, I'm really grateful for you for, for extending it. Uh, for you know to to talk with me here, and you know I, I, I just going back to to the to the dedication of um, of, of the book uh, to to my fellow journalists, I feel enormously privileged to be able to do what I do, uh, to work with you at CNN, to to write for the New Yorker, to be able to write a book like this. I mean, and and no one tells you know sometimes it's interesting. Wolf, you know I, I I'll, I'll be out in the world and people will will uh, ask me, you know, when you're on with Wolf, does someone tell you what to say? No one tells me what to say. No one tells me what to write. No one tells me what to, and, and I feel incredibly fortunate um, the, to, to, to have the, these opportunities, to have these jobs. And uh, I hope people like the book. I assume you, uh, you get uh, up every morning as I do and look forward to going to work because you've been able to combine your passion, your interest. Uh, even if you had become a hedge fund guy, uh, you would have probably still been a news junkie as I am, right? You know, it, it, it is so true. I, 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 I am sometimes embarrassed, but when I hear other people complaining about their jobs, and I love my job, I love my jobs, and uh, I'm, I'm, I, but I, I always try to remember just as, in this in, in this environment, uh, I feel lucky, especially to have a healthy self and a healthy family. Uh, I try always to be grateful, but I but I'm lucky. I I, I'm, I get to do what I do. Yep, we're all we're both very lucky. Uh, I think on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Michael uh, to wrap this up. Uh, but on behalf of all of our viewers, uh, Jeffrey, here in the United States and around the world, thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> As you say every day. Thanks, yeah. Wolf. I appreciate it. And on that note, thanks so much to both Jeff and Wolf. Um, such an incredibly entertaining, insightful conversation. Thanks so much to everyone at home for tuning in. You've been a wonderful audience. Uh, we do hope you'll consider purchasing a copy of True Crimes and Misdemeanors. Signed books are for sale. Use the link in the chat field. And please join us tomorrow night, Wednesday, August 12th, 6 p.m. Eastern for our next Two Writers Talking event, conversation between Ingrid Rojas Contreras, Mega Majumdar, moderated by Entertainment Weekly's David Canfield. We'll drop a link in the chat as well. So thanks so much to everyone. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.